So probably the most familiar use of manifold learning came to biologist consciousness with the rise of single cell and single nuclei sequencing technologies. You probably are very familiar with UMAP uh, embedding showing the clusters of cell in some tissue. So for the next 15 or 20 minutes, I will try to walk you through a brief overview of single cell sequencing. I will go over the sequencing technology that allows us to study the gene expression on a single cell or single nuclei level. And we will also mention some of the problems of the field and some proposed solutions. So in the past, it was possible to do RNA sequencing where all the cells would be mixed up together and then some average cell would be quantified. But as we all know very well, an average never actually exists in the world. So there is no average cell that expresses this average profile of genes. And just about 10 years ago, it has become possible to quantify each individual cell from the tissue on a large scale. And first, people could sequence hundreds of cells at a time. But today, we can quantify the expression of genes in thousands and even tens of thousands of cells uh, in each sample at a time. And there are several uh, slightly different methods to obtain the single cell or single nuclear data, but all of them have some basic steps. Uh, these steps include single cell dissociation, when the tissue uh, is treated with uh, reagents to separate the cells from each other, so they would later fit into a droplet or a microwell. Library construction, where a special bead is placed into a drop of oil or microwell, and each bead contains a cell barcode and a molecule barcode. So all RNA molecules in a cell are labeled with a cell barcode and different molecule barcode. And then the library is amplified and sequenced. So as a result of the initial analysis where the barcodes are recognized and reads coming from specific cells are sorted into those cells and also are aligned on the genome to quantify the expression of genes in each cell, you get a table where rows are genes or features and columns are cells. And typically this table would consist of about 20,000 rows, so 20,000 genes and thousands of cells in each sample. So what are the challenges of these data? Large volumes of data uh, are generated in each experiment. So each cell is presented by expression of 20,000 genes. So high dimensionality of data, low depth of sequencing uh, per cell. And this means that the data is sparse. Uh, many genes appear to have zero expression. expression. Uh, when in, uh, in reality, they don't. And there is also variability across samples. Uh, we call this batch effect. And these challenges are really driving the field of single cell sequencing forward. The research community has been really invested in trying to overcome these computational challenges and also technological challenges. So uh, we at Tauber have implemented a very popular pipeline, SURA, for analysis of single cell sequencing. And this pipeline was developed in Satija Lab at New York Genome Center. The pipeline is a collection of R packages. And we have implemented this on the T-BioInfo to allow easier analysis without the need to code or run R scripts. Uh, the pipeline consists of several steps of analysis. First, some pre-processing is needed. Uh, these models help to clean out the artifacts in the data. So for example, doublets, which are uh, droplets or microwells that have two cells instead of one. Uh, and we can identify these doublets by the amount of gene expressed in these cells. So they are an outliers if we calculate the overall expression of genes. And in the graph, you uh, can see those as N features. And we can also identify these cells by the amount of molecules, or here on the graph called N counts. We can also uh, throw out cells which are undergoing stress. And we identify these cells by the amount of mitochondrial genes in these cells. And the assumption behind this is that a large percent of genes that are expressed in the cell are mitochondrial. These cells are highly stressed, 
uh, perhaps due to the dissociation step of the analysis or other steps of the single cell sequencing. Uh, we could also regress out or take out the effect of cell cycle changes. Uh, some researchers believe that regressing out the cell cycle effect normalizes the gene expression across cells. And so the cells of the same time, type are more similar to each other than if we would not regress out the cell cycle. However, others have pointed out that the knowledge of cell cycle effect might reflect the underlying biology and help elucidate important mechanisms uh, of the biological phenomena. Uh, next uh, step of the analysis, uh, if you have several samples and you will try to analyze them, we need to consider batch effect when, uh, when we compare these biological samples. Here you can see the single nuclei RNA sequencing data from kidney samples of control mice, group one, and kidney samples of diabetic mice, group two. Uh, the dots are cells that are colored based on their sample identity. You can see that before batch correction, samples are actually separated from each other, even though they belong to the same group. So in group one, the green and the orange uh, dots take up different parts of the UMAP space. The same as in the group two, blue and pink dots are separated. In reality, however, we assume that cells taken from the same biological conditions would represent the whole assembly of cell types, uh, the whole cell uh, populations, and thus would be spread out across uh, the whole of UMAP space. There are several algorithms that help to eliminate this batch effect. And one algorithm is called Harmony, and when we apply it to our data, we see that now all samples are spread out across all clusters and are mixed together. So the algorithm has successfully eliminated this batch effect due to the sampling. Uh, next section of the single cell analysis is manifold learning. Uh, and as we have seen in the previous presentations, manifold learning algorithms are based on different measure of distance and reveal different structures uh, underlying our original data space. In single cell analysis, perhaps the most popular algorithm for representing the data on a two-dimensional plane is UMAP. And maybe it's a historical fact, but if you search through literature on a single cell uh, analysis, most likely you will see UMAP dimensionality reduction figure in the single cell article. Uh, so UMAP has been successfully uh, uh, used to cluster cells into groups which have similar gene expression profiles and so probably belong to the same biological cell type. The next part of the analysis workflow is probably the most labor intensive and most complicated, and it is the annotation of cell clusters by their biological cell type. And here we rely on marker genes either known markers of cells or unsupervised markers of clusters. For example, here again, the kidney data set, control kidney tissues compared to diabetic tissue. One of the known markers of collecting duct cells is the gene HSD11B2. And we can graph this gene so that the cell on the two-dimensional plane using UMAP, so that cells that express the gene highly are highlighted in uh, yellow. And we will see that the highlight cluster on the UMAP space is cluster number zero. So we would identify this cluster zero as a collecting duct cells. Another possibility is to find unsupervised markers of cluster zero. So here you see uh, two genes that are expressed highly in cluster, uh, in cluster zero while they are not expressed or expressed in low amounts in other clusters. Uh, and again, you see here differentially expressed markers for cluster zero. The dots here represent cells that are expressing the gene. Uh, we can also visualize the expression of genes as violent plots. In this plot, we see expression levels of this gene across all found clusters of, gene, of cells. So we see that the gene uh, WSBY 
one uh, is actually expressed in all of the clusters, uh, while HSD11B2 is expressed in some of the clusters. But you can see that both WSB1 and HSD11B2 is expressed most highly in cluster uh, number zero. So they are markers of this cluster number zero. And as we uh, have discussed, we were lucky this time and HSD11B2 uh, is actually a known marker of collecting duct cells. So in this way, we could theoretically at least annotate all of the clusters uh, that we have. And as I said, this part of the analysis is uh, labor intensive, demands a lot of time, biological knowledge, literature review, and so on. So uh, there have been many attempts to automate this step. However, the quality of annotation using known tissue atlases depends on the data set, on the tissue you are studying, and also on the experimental procedure because diseased tissue or treated tissue might change the expression of the known markers, and this will also be hard to annotate. So at the moment, this step is perhaps the bottleneck of many projects, and it remains an active area of research and also software development. And finally, once you are satisfied with the annotation step, some differential expression analysis can be done. For example, if we would be interested in identifying the genes that are differentially expressed in the collecting duct cells uh, in diabetes, we could perform a differential analysis inside cluster zero, for the two groups and identify pathways and genes that are differentially expressed in diabetes compared to control cells. And so uh, this is just basic steps of the analysis of single cell uh, RNA-seq data. Thank you.